All right, in this lecture, we're going to talk about SciPy. SciPy is uh, an add-on to Python, which enables uh, or gives access to a large, vast array of numerical functions uh, for scientific computing. So this is where a lot of the functionality that would replicate, say, MATLAB would come in. And SciPy works very closely uh, with NumPy. So uh, basically, uh, SciPy is organized into a whole bunch of different sub packages or sub modules covering, you know, or organized by these different scientific computing areas. Uh, if you're looking for a particular function or a particular functionality, my advice would be to just Google it and keep in mind that if you can do it in MATLAB, you can almost mo you can most likely uh, do it in um, in SciPy as well. Uh, with uh, you know a lot of additional functionality in my opinion because you have the full power of the, of the Python language. So here are just some of the modules, uh, probably the most popular ones. These are the ones that are listed uh, on SciPy's website, but uh, you know the, at the beginning of the documentation pages. But there are many more. Uh, so this, the special functions uh, sub module is going to be where you'd find like your Bessel functions and your Chebyshev polynomials and things like that. Uh, integration is just what it sounds like, uh, your integration routines both for data and functions. Um, optimization, so this includes all your nonlinear optimization routines, nonlinear conjugate gradient, steepest descent, these things. This is also where you find your, new, uh, your root solving. Uh, interpolation for interpolating, say, polynomials or data. Uh, Fourier transforms is just what it sounds like. Uh, signal processing, so this is where you'd see your, your, your filters, your <coughs> Chebyshev filters or uh, otherwise. Uh, linear algebra, this is where you're going to find all your typical linear algebra, you know, eigenvalues, uh, things like that. If, if you do have very, spar very large sparse arrays, you can get some performance gains by uh, using the uh, sparse data structures to find you know, eigenvalues or, or solving linear systems of very sparse equations. There's also sparse graph routines, uh, big statistics package with lots of different distributions and uh, probably density functions and cumulative dis distribution functions that are defined on you know, many, many functions like Weibull and normal distributions, other things. Uh, so special file output, I out input output, uh, you know, your, your normal text and data files formats would be here also, like, say, NetCDF format. Uh, Weave is something that's built into Python that allows you to basically inline C++ code. So you can actually write a little snippet of C++ code and uh, wrap, wrap it with Weave, and uh, this will compile it on the fly and then, and then implement your function so that you can call it from Python. Uh, we're going to le learn about a more general ways to basically s call you know C and C++ functions using uh, C types and then later a SWIG, but um, th this is one way that's built right into SciPy. So I'm just going to go through a real quick couple examples here. Uh, there's no way you know we could teach an entire course if we wanted to, uh, much like you could teach an entire course on MATLAB. You could teach an entire course on SciPy and all the different uh, functionality it has. Uh, that would really, you know, fit well into a numerical analysis class as you're you're building up and wa walking through and talking about all the algorithms. Uh, but for for our purposes, I just wanted to to show you a couple examples to show you how you might actually call or use uh, some of these libraries, and basically you could follow that template for anything else. So, you know, if you wanted to integrate this function, just a real simple function, which of course we can analy uh, analytically integrate, uh, then the, the code that we would use to, to integrate it is there. Uh, real quickly, there's maybe something here that you haven't seen or been familiar with, and that's this lambda function. So, in MATLAB, you'd call this an anonymous function. I think a more general is, uh, term is a lambda function in other languages. But basically, this allows you to in a kind of shorthand notation, create functions on the fly. Uh, I'll give you a quick example of that. So if we launch Python, uh, you know, the typical way to define a function would be to use this def. So we'd say def f of x. Say uh, if 
we wanted uh, f of x to just be like say for instance x squared okay so then if we call uh, f2 that would square 2 and return it okay for if we call f3 that would square 3 and return it 9 of course okay so we can also uh, basically just use a lambda function to do this in shorthand so we could also say f lambda x x squared and then uh, this is going to return the same results so it's just a shorthand way to define functions it's good for uh, you know little one-liner functions uh, again, in MATLAB, I think you'd call these anonymous functions. So we use the lambda function to, to, de to define x squared, and then we call this uh, scipy integrate quad uh, for quadrature. Quadrature is another word for integration. So uh, that's going to return an answer and also an, an error estimate, and so there you'd see the answer uh, if we integrate that from, from 0 to 4. Uh, it, there, you know, obviously, um, obviously, it, it, there's there's some tiny bit of error uh, in there. So there's also double quad for you know integrating double integrals, triple quad for integrating triple integrals, and then some other things, namely like trapezoid and Simpson's rule for integrating data. Uh, encourage you to look at that. It may seem clunky to have to, you know, do this import scipy integrate and then and then call it here. There's ways to shorten that notation, but there are very good reasons for using these namespaces. And as you become more familiar with, uh, you know, object-oriented programming or programming in Python, um, you, you'll begin to see why that is. And that's namely that, you know, these the, a function like quad could be defined in multiple namespaces uh, and operate in different ways depending on the data. Uh, so I'll just leave it at that for now, but th there is a good reason for, for doing that. Uh, here's uh, some examples from a linear algebra package. So uh, basically here I, I'm importing NumPy and then using it to create a random uh, three by three matrix that I'm then solving for the inverse of, okay, and then this is the output, of course. Um, same thing, eigenvalues, I, I uh, import NumPy, create a random 3 by 3 matrix, and then solve for the eigenvalues. In this case, they're here, they're uh, complex numbers. Another one that you might uh, use is interpolate. So here I'm just going to interpolate some data and in the absence of being able to plot, uh, I haven't shown you how you might plot from within NumPy, SciPy, Python. Uh, we're going to talk about that next time with a package called matplotlib. But in the absence of being able to plot that, we want to be able to compare two functions so we might, you know, look at their integrals. And if their integrals are close to the same, we might, uh, you know, um, it's by no way a guarantee that uh, if two functions have similar integrals that they're similar functions, but, um, you know, in the absence of being able to do anything else, this is a quick way to check. So basically, uh, what I'm going to do is define, uh, uh, using NumPy, define a, a range of data from minus 1 to 11. And this is going to be in steps of 1, so that what that array is going to look like would be minus 1, 0, 1, 2, so on. And then using the, this data, x, I'm going to define uh, uh, the y values. So uh, x will be plugged in here and this will create a new y where uh, y is evaluated at using this exponential function here. Okay, so then I'm going to interpolate that data and, and assign the, the output of that will be a, a, a function, a lambda type function, f, okay. So we'll, we'll interpolate it, uh, it'll, be, it'll be assigned to f, okay. So then to compare the two, let's integrate them. So first we'll use Simpson's rule to integrate the data itself, x and y. And in this case, I'm only going to integrate from 0 to 10. So I'm going to take from the first value to the minus 1 value, which would be uh, 10. So that would be 0 to 10 for both the x and y. And that gives us this, this value of the integral. Um, so then we can actually use the analytic integration of, of this guy. So then in this case, we'll use a quadrature rule. We're going to integrate f from 0 to 10, and we get this answer. So you can see those two values are 
pretty close to one another. Um, you know, of course, there's going to be some error because we're in, when we integrate the data, we're, we're only sampling the data and drawing basically straight lines through it. And then when we interpolate it, we interpolate it with polynomials, uh, which don't give us a perfect fit back to what you know the original functional function is. But it does a decent enough job. So, you know, why Python, NumPy, SciPy? Well. Uh, again, like I've said many times in the course so far, it's a, it's a free alternative to MATLAB. Uh, in, in my experience, the combination of these uh, packages can reproduce everything that MATLAB can do. Um, please don't quote me on that. I, I'm sure there's some function functionality buried in MATLAB that, that is not available here. Uh, but for your normal day-to-day uh, -day operations, uh, you know, normal things you do in engineering and scientific computing, um, all the all the functionality is there, in my opinion. Um, it's it's also faster, in my opinion, in my experience. Now, again, don't quote me on that. I'm not saying it's always faster, but most of the problems I've ever solved, uh, I, I can solve them quickly, more quickly using um, um, Python Python with these uh, packages. So, uh, another advantage is that we get the full fa the full power of the Python language. So, Python from the very beginning was built to be an object-oriented language. Um, you know, which if you prefer to program in that style, it's a style that allows for very reproducible code. Uh, re I'm sorry, reusable code, such that um, you know you can you can write uh, very abstract objects that are classes that uh, you can then build upon and, and use in your work. Um, it's also, of course, a procedural language, um, and, and it's almost a functional language. So it gives you a couple of options as to how you would typically uh, program. Of course, MATLAB, you know, because it's basically written, built on top of Fortran, up until very, very recently, only offered this kind of procedural uh, programming style. Um, I know recently they've added some object-oriented features to it, but again, Python was built from the very beginning to be an object-oriented language. Um, and so there's going to be some more convincing arguments to come next week when we talk about Matplotlib. You'll see that there's a very MATLAB-like plotting uh, functionality built right in. And then the, the, the most advantageous uh, reasons for me is that you can call C and C++ and Fortran code directly from Python. Uh, we'll talk about how to do that or a couple of ways to do that. This uh, allows the ability to greatly speed up your code. Um, basically, you can write all your code in Python and profile it and figure out exactly where your code is slow and then one by one kind of port those subroutines or the slow areas of your code over to C and then call into them. And then finally, uh, we can do MPI style parallel programming with this module um, MPI for Pi. So MPI is kind of the de facto standard for parallel pr programming, certainly on distributed memory machines or the suit type of supercomputers that we have now. Um, and uh, the application programming interface uh, that is built into MPI for Pi almost exactly mimics the C or C++ implementation. So if you know um, the C or C++ API for MPI, you can basically pick up and start programming right away uh, in Python using this paradigm. And it, it'll be much more concise uh, syntax and you should be able to write the code quicker. It's also a good way to, to learn MPI, which we'll be doing in this class. We're basically going to assume you have no knowledge of it, and we're going to learn the API uh, through demonstrations in Python, and this will be a nice place for you to start, such that in the future, if you end up writing C or C++ or Fortran code with, uh, with the MPI application programming interface, you'll, you'll already be familiar with the, with the calls.